welcome to this final uh, home composting class for uh, our October round of uh, teaching folks how to uh, compost in their backyard. Uh, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to give you the basics to get started, or if you're already started, uh, help you make the process work better. Uh, I personally believe that composting should be as simple as possible. I don't get into a whole lot of the science. I'm a history major, but I do know it works very well, uh, and you can put as much effort into it uh, as you'd like uh, or as, uh, as little effort in it as you like. I have one compost bin that I don't touch. Uh, I, I set it up once a year and uh, fill it up with some additional stuff from my garden and uh, every that once a year time I'll have compost. I hope that uh, it'll be warm enough for me to take that bin and tear it apart and start it again next weekend. If it's too cold, it'll sit and wait till spring. It's a forgiving process, and the question really is, what's the goal that you have? There are ways to try and uh, get as much compost as possible from it, and there are other ways to go about doing it that uh, you're just going to try and get rid of as much of the material that you generate in your yard uh, or some of your food scraps and uh, take whatever compost you get. Composting is a natural process. Uh, and really, the reason we get into it in terms of setting up compost bins, uh, compost heaps, is to speed it up. That's one of the good things that humans can do. We can speed up the composting process. Now, unfortunately, we can also screw it up. But uh, it is really easy, I think, to do because I always resisted it at first because I didn't want another hobby. Now that I've been doing it for the last 25 years, uh, it works very simply. You can fit it in and do it, like I said, as hard, uh, put as much into it or as little into it as you want. We use a bin as opposed to just letting it sit uh, in order to uh, get a handle on it. It helps speed it up. You can get better airflow by setting it up in a bin uh, it helps you retain water, and it helps you retain temperature. Now, when we talk about temperature in compost, and this presentation makes several references to temperature, what we're talking about is the temperature that's generated inside the compost pile. It's not external temperature. So it's the temperature from inside, and that temperature indicates how well the process is working. You can put your compost bin out in the sun, in an area with full sun, and the one benefit you will get from having that heat from the sun is that your compost pile will stay uh, usable a little longer into the wintertime and might uh, thaw out sooner in the springtime. But that's a minor benefit, and really the heat that's important, the temperature, is what comes from the inside. Um, compost does wonders for the health of your soil. You're putting a lot of organic material back into the soil. One of the problems we have uh, in this country as a whole is the lack of organic matter that is in our soil, whether it's in our yards or in our fields. That organic matter begins to go away and it causes uh, I guess the soil isn't as rich, and we have to supplement then for the, account for that lack of organic material with fertilizers. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this organic matter, this richer soil, will attract earthworms, which aerate the soil and create more compost as they work their way through. It helps your soil hold water better and also helps it retain nutrients much better. Uh, Compost will improve your, toils, your soil's tilth and friability. Now, that doesn't have anything to do with the ability to saute your soil in olive oil. It's about how easy your soil breaks up. That's what we're talking about with tilth and friability. Uh, it can add organic material to sandy soil, loosen up heavy clay soil. So if you have soil like that on your property and you want to try to bring it back or turn it into more productive soil, you can do that with compost. Uh, 
It takes a lot of compost and time to fully accomplish those goals. So you may not generate enough compost yourself to reclaim some of these areas, but you can get compost from one of the Dane County compost sites and start using a greater volume of that and mixing it in with the clay or sandy soil to improve it. It also improves your soil's drainage and it can suppress some plant uh, pathogens that can be in the soil. Um, the key thing with compost though, and I think the reason that we're all interested in it is the nutrients that it provides for plant growth. Compost has the right kind of nutrients in the right amount and in the right form so that your plants can access those nutrients, draw them up and put them to use. A lot of commercial fertilizers uh, kind of have nutrient overkill. There's too much there for your plants to absorb, but they want to make sure you get enough. It's like uh, the prescriptions we take have more medication in it than we can absorb, but to make sure we get a therapeutic dose, they put that in. Same thing is true with commercial fertilizers. To give your plants a therapeutic dose, there's more material in there than they can absorb and it leaches away. But with compost, it's right there. And it's also, again, in a form that plants can draw on. Compost is really dirt. And this is what our plants were meant to grow in. And it really does a great job. And in addition to having phosphorus, nitrogen, some of those other nutrients, it also has the little trace elements of all those things that appear in the fine print on your vitamin bottle. Uh, the same kind of thing for plants. Uh, you can use your finished compost as a soil amendment. Now this slide talks about putting on no more than two inches of compost. Um, I don't really follow that guideline too much. Uh, if you've got good finished compost, uh, like especially the stuff you would get from Dane County to apply in large batches, or the stuff that's gonna come out of your compost pile at home, you can put on a, as much as you have. Uh, you know, four inches, that's fine. You're going to work it into the top four to six, maybe even eight inches of the soil is where you're going to work it in. And um, that's one of the ways you can use it. That's probably the most common way a lot of us use compost is we spread it on the garden and then we work it in. Now, you can use it also as a surface mulch. Uh, in the summertime, when you, if you generate compost, you can use it. It's going to be kind of dense and moist when it comes out in the summertime. You can use it as a mulch to suppress weeds around plants, just like you would another kind of mulch, and those nutrients will seep into the ground. You can work them in during the summertime if you want. Uh, they talk here about using it uh, with trees. The idea is to put it out a little bit from the base so that the roots can absorb the nutrients because it's the fine, smaller roots that are really going to take up the nutrients from compost. So you might want to move it away a little bit. Uh, but again, you can put it in where it's going to fit uh, in your gardening situation. You can use finished compost as a top dressing on your lawn. You should screen it before you do it, get it down and then put about a quarter of an inch, in this case I'd follow those directions, and rake it in. Works very well. Now, I don't do this at home because I don't have a yard, a lawn. I have a yard. So I have lots of interesting things. My front yard is almost all violets these days. But uh, compost does work very well, but you should screen it. If you get compost from the Dane County compost sites, um, they have screen compost and it's gonna look like good fine black dirt. You can use compost in potting mixture. I don't recommend it very highly for houseplants. A little bit. It says here about a third by volume. I might even go down to a quarter for houseplants. Now if you have worm compost, vermicompost is wonderful for houseplants. And you, can't, um, you can almost not put enough in there. But regular compost from your garden doesn't work quite as well with houseplants. Compost tea is a great way to extend a small amount of compost and get a lot of work out of it. What you're going to do is take your finished compost, put it in some cheesecloth, tie that up just like a tea bag, 
and seep it in a five gallon pail or a one gallon pail of water. And then you can use that liquid to water your garden, just like you might do with uh, miracle Grow. I think is one of those things that you mix up and put on, do the same thing with, uh, with compost tea. And then you can take the compost when you've made a couple of doses of tea and just throw it in your garden. Uh, but that is a good way to extend a compost. It's also a good way to do things like um, if you're container gardening, you've got tomatoes in five gallon buckets or something, that's a good way to uh, get them those nutrients. Um, so now the time comes to figure out where we're going to put the compost bin. One of the most important things is make sure you have enough room to work. If you have a compost bin, you should have about twice the size of that bin as a work area to do your jobs. Like if you have one of those earth machines that we sold, uh, have an area at least as big as that next to it so you can take it off, move it over, and turn the stuff back in. The same might be true with uh, other types of compost bins. That's usually the best way to do it. Now you can do it with a little less, but make sure you've got room to get in and work it. Don't put it right up against a building so you can't fork it from one side. Um, you want to make sure, it says here that you want to have it uh, where you can reach it with a garden hose. Well, that's probably true, but you can also use a sprinkling can to get water to it. That's uh, going to be up to you, or just get another 50-foot length of hose. <laughs> um, it's important, too, to have it where you uh, are going to generate the material or where you're going to use the finished compost close to one of those places. Generally speaking, people put it right next to their gardens because that's where the compost is going to get used. That's where you're going to generate quite a bit of the organic material you put in. And then what you're going to end up carrying to it uh, are going to be, if you're going to do food scraps from your kitchen, carry that there. Um, you want good drainage. You don't want to put it in the low spot where you know, a half an inch of water always accumulates when you get a, uh, a good rainstorm. Um, you want to keep it at least two feet away from a building, not only to give yourself room to work, but primarily for airflow for the compost pile. Uh, I did uh, come across a compost bin that had been placed right next to a wooden garage, and I had to inform the person that their garage was slowly composting. <laughs> But uh, so you want to be careful about that. Uh, and also, it says, talks about being a good neighbor. Know what's going on on the other side of the fence. You know your relationship with your neighbors. If you've got a good relationship with your neighbors, a compost bin is going to be no problem. If you've got a bad relationship with your neighbors, a compost bin can be a red flag. So don't put it right next to the patio where they entertain four nights a week in the summertime. Your compost bin is not going to smell when you do things right, but if they smell something funny, rest assured, they are going to blame that on your compost bin. Now, building a bin, if you're going to build one, and I have some plans here that uh, you can take uh, with you if you'd like. We also have plans. There are plans available on the uh, University uh, of Wisconsin Extension Solid and Hazardous Waste Education Center website. And you can make compost bins out of lots of things. Uh, rabbit fencing is a good way to make a compost bin. Rabbit fencing, a couple clips and maybe a couple of drive posts is a nice simple bin. Uh, you can get very elaborate and build a three-bin system out of wood. Uh, I don't really recommend building a compost bin out of concrete block like they show here. On the other hand, if you have a lot of concrete block laying around, go ahead and use it to make a compost bin. That's fine. The size is, is important. Uh, a three-foot cube to a five-foot cube, so that's nine cubic feet to 25 cubic feet or so. That size will help keep the warmth in, retain moisture, provide airflow. When you get bigger than five feet, uh, five by five by five, you probably need a bobcat to handle it. It's getting to be too big to manage. Now, I've got a guy here in town who has several big piles like that, maybe even a little bit bigger. 
He's got it down to a science, and he spends a lot of time on it. And that's great. But really, right around a 3 by 3 by 3 size is uh, really good. Now, you can use any one of these different types of manufactured bins. The one that's not up there is the Earth Machine, which we sell or have been selling for years. Uh, those commercial bins work fine. They're usually a little on the small side, but they're designed to help people get started, and they do work well. I do not recommend those rotating tumbler drums. They are way too expensive. And the other thing that happens is you, you, it's really hard to add material to it as you go. You're basically going to fill it up, let the process work, turn it, and just work with what's in there. Because when you keep adding stuff, you're adding material that hasn't composted to stuff that's partially composted to stuff that might be fully composted, and it's getting all mixed together. And a lot of times when you're rotating that drum, you're disrupting the process. So unless you, uh, unless you know somebody who's got physical disabilities, for them a bin like this can work really well. But if not, the rotating drums just are, are not worth the investment. And people always think, well, it makes it easy to turn. But the easiest way to turn your compost pile is not to turn it. And we'll talk about that. The next thing that, that we need is going to be the food for the bugs. Okay, And we'll talk a little bit more in a couple of slides about what kind of food to compost. Then there are all these bugs that get involved in the process. Big ones, little ones, microorganisms, bacteria, fungal threads, all those things. One of the key things to making sure that insects that you need in the process have a good, and it, actually they're not all insects, worms really aren't insects, uh, that have an access to your pile is when you spot your pile, take the, the grass off. Put it in direct contact with the soil itself. That's always a good thing to do. Uh, the other piece then oxygen, water, and warmth, sort of what we lead, you know. Um, so food for the compost. Any kind of organic material really is going to work. Uh, kitchen scraps, there's some do's and don'ts. Garden trimmings, almost anything from your garden is going to be fine. Grass, the best thing you can do uh, is leave it on the lawn, but realize that grass is a good source of nitrogen. And if you need nitrogen, it's there and it's free, okay? So you can pick that up to add to it. But usually what you're going to be short of is material high in carbon like leaves. So another trick is to hang on to a couple bags of leaves from the fall to use during the course of the year to add brown material to your compost pile. You can also make one of those wire bins and just use that as a leaf holding bin. Just put leaves in there and draw them out during the rest of the year to mix in with the, uh, the nitrogen rich material. So here's where we have to start paying attention. What kind of food can you compost? Now there are lots of things that could theoretically be composted, but it's dictated by uh, avoiding odor and pests, and also there's an ordinance that restricts what you can and can't compost. So any kind of fruit waste is fine. Uh, uncooked vegetable scraps, corn cobs, corn husks, those can go in. Corn cobs break down very slowly. You could put them in, okay? If you boil your vegetables or steam your vegetables, you can take the leftovers there and compost them. However, once you saute them in butter, oil, put a little cheese sauce on them, anything that makes it more attractive to you is going to make it more attractive to the pests. Rocky Raccoon does not really have a broccoli addiction, but he has a cheese addiction, and so cheese sauce on the broccoli, he's coming for the cheese. Eggshells can go in. We were talking about that just a little earlier. Eggshells, it's a good thing to break them up. And you won't see them always go away. See little bits of eggshell there? They will gradually decompose when you spread that compost in your garden. And as they're decomposing, there's calcium and protein that are going in to help strengthen the soil. Tea bags. 
can go in. Coffee grounds and coffee filters. Spoiled juice, okay? Uh, that's on here. Just remember you want to use that as moisture. Um, meat Manure from herbivores, non-meat eaters. Now, the only manure you can actually legally compost in Madison is from horse manure, is horse manure. But there are lots of folks that, you know, you have a pet rabbit, a pet gerbil, a pet hamster. That bedding can go in there because that stuff decomposes really quickly, okay? And that's not going to pose a problem. Uh, now, what you want to avoid, any kind of meat, bones, fish, sauces, gravy, dairy products, cheese, milk, yogurt, fats, oils, and grease, bread and baked goods. All these things should be avoided because that's what's going to bring the critters run into your pile. They also have the potential, things like sauces, gravy, fats, and oils, dairy products. They cause, they restrict airflow and cause odor for another reason as well. Some other materials to avoid. CCA treated lumber or sawdust. Well, we treat lumber so that it won't rot. <laughs> so you won't want to put treated lumber or sawdust from treated lumber in there. On the other hand, if you're going to make a bin out of wood, uh, I have no, I suggest using treated lumber. I have a bin made with treated lumber, the old CCA treated lumber, and I'm perfectly fine. At least I think I am, okay? Manure from meat-eating animals. You don't want to put dog feces, cat feces in there, uh, badger feces. Um, there is a parasite that can be transmitted from meat eater to meat eater that is not killed in the, comp the backyard composting process. Now, so if you were to put that compost on your tomatoes, there's a chance. It's not a very big chance, but there's a chance. There's, a, there's, there's agreement, there, there's disagreement on certain things. That certain com one compost book will tell you you can compost this, and another one will say no on certain things. But in every piece of literature, it says no manure for meat-eating animals. There's universal agreement on that, that it doesn't happen often, but when it does happen, it's not nice. So you just don't want to do it. Garlic mustard, if you have garlic mustard, Put it in the trash. That's where we want it. We don't even want it in our big compost piles. That'll get much hotter than the piles you'll have in your backyard. We don't want garlic mustard. Same thing with invasive species. There's other invasive species you probably want to keep out. And I'll touch on a couple other things, just some quack grass in the next slide. But this is the important part here. The thing to remember is that when in doubt, leave it out. If you're not sure, don't compost it, okay? You usually won't go wrong trusting your own instincts on that. If you think it shouldn't, don't. Uh, okay, we talked about fats, oils, grease, and dairy products. There are some hard-to-kill weeds. I don't know what bindweed is, but I know quack grass. I've composted that in my backyard, in my backyard bin. But, you know, again, if you went in doubt, leave it out. Weeds that have gone to seed, if you're concerned about weeds, now, if your compost bin gets up to 120 to 140 degrees, it should kill weed seeds. But take the flowers or the seed pods off before you put the rest of the weed into the garden. Things like quack grass and some of the things like dandelions, that the roots are a big part of the problem. Those are the things you might want to think about cutting off the roots or not putting them in. Charcoal briquette ash uh, is chemically treated. So you probably don't want to put that in. Um, I've used it as a mulch. And again, like the treated lumber, I seem to be fine. <laughs> um, and then branches. Now, branches won't decompose very well, but there is a place for them in the compost pile. We'll talk about that when we get to building a pile. Um, lime, agricultural lime is what we're talking about here actually can have a place in small amounts when you're composting a lot of oak trees, oak leaves, or pine needles because they're very acidic. The lime can help balance the pH with that. But you'll experiment with it, put in better too little than too much to start. But if you have a lot of that material, 
agricultural lime can help. Wood ash can be added to your pile. You want to add it sparingly because you don't want, because of its, the way it is, it's very, it'll cause airflow problems. So you don't want to throw a big clump of it in there. It'll cause an odor center. But if you sprinkle some in, that's fine. The same would be true if you do woodworking and you have some sawdust you want to use. It's a source of carbon, but you want to sprinkle it in. You don't want, to, you don't want it to form a barrier for moisture or for, for, to freeze out air and retain moisture. Wood ash from your fireplace is also really good on sidewalks and driveways in the wintertime. Great for traction. Um, if it's been treated with a pesticide, herbicide, fungicide, uh, some folks say wait seven days and put it in. Uh, that's where you have to trust your judgment. You know, that's a when in doubt, leave it out kind of thing. Uh, but it can go in, and we like we take this stuff at our compost sites, and we deal with it. But um, for your own backyard bin, you have to trust your own judgment on that, whether you want to use it or not. Now, we want to try and provide a balance, a balanced diet for those compost bugs. And a balanced diet consists of having the proper carbon to nitrogen ratio. So for all you scientists out there, the proper carbon to nitrogen ratio is 30 to 1. Now, I don't exactly know what that means, okay? But, and I don't know how you measure it, but we talk about layering a compost bin, and when I talk about building one, we'll talk about layering it. And the reason we layer it is to measure. That's the purpose, to try to find this balance between brown material and green material. But your compost process will work at 28 to 1, 19 to 1, you know. It doesn't have to be perfect to work. It will work. But you want to try and move it towards the ideal ratio uh, to try and maximize your bin's ability to process material and your ability to get compost from it. Another way to look at it is a 3 to 1 ratio of, of brown material to green material, and that's going to be by size. The, the size of your brown layer is going to be about three times bigger than the size of your green layer. Another way I always express it is 50-50 by weight. Again, the leaves are going to weigh less than the food. It's about the same thing. So brown material is high in carbon. Green material is high in nitrogen. Now these numbers show you that some brown material is browner than others. So straw is a little higher carbon content than leaves. Uh, paper. I really don't recommend you compost paper, okay? We've got recycling programs for it. It's a higher and better use. But there are things like paper towel that if you, if you have been doing some composting, it's working for you, you want to try tearing it up, shredding it up, and putting it in there, I say go ahead, give it a shot, okay? Straw is one of those things that's out there that in the summertime, you're starting, you know, you're getting a bin going, you don't have any leaves left, you can usually go somewhere and get a bale of straw, garden centers or something, and it's not that expensive, and it's a real good brown material because it's bulky, so it helps airflow as well. Not that leaves don't, but straw is a lot harder to compress sometimes than leaves. Um, mentioned sawdust before. Animal bedding, uh, you know, you just pretty much want to stay away from it, and it's less the, you know, we talked about that, the rabbits, the gerbils, the hamsters. Green material, high in nitrogen. All food material is considered green. Fruit and vegetable scraps. Coffee browns, grounds are brown, but they're green, okay? And that includes your coffee filters. Um, grass clippings, again, it's a source of nitrogen. The only manure, we talked about manure before, um, poultry manure and hog manure. I mean, you better not ever bring that into the city uh, for your compost pile. Um, well, there are some people who have their own chickens, so they have it, but uh, in small quantities. Um, and uh, another thing, another good source 
of nitrogen that's very inexpensive is the composted cow manure that you get in bags at the store. There's quite a bit of that out there. It's not that expensive. Now, all the bacteria in there are dead. It's been in a plastic bag too long with nothing to eat, okay? But it's a really good source of nitrogen, and it doesn't cost much. So that's another thing to keep in mind. So some characteristics, browns decay slowly, greens decay rapidly. The best way to test that if you don't believe the scientists is to take a bag of grass clippings and a bag of leaves, tie them shut. In a week, open up the bag of brown leaves. It won't smell a thing. Open up the bag of green grass clippings and pass out. Okay. <laughs> Browns uh, are usually are coarser material. Uh, greens are usually denser, wetter, so they can cause odor problems. Uh, browns tend to accumulate in the fall. Greens that aren't food waste will accumulate in the spring and summer. Uh, it's best to mix them together is what we're going to get here. Now, some of the bugs that are going to be involved in the process. The best worms are the red wigglers, the little ones. Night crawlers don't really do much in a compost pile. Um, you don't need to go out and buy worms. They'll find their way in there. They tend to be kind of expensive way to jumpstart your compost pile. Uh, sow bugs are in there, mites, springtails, beetles, centipedes, millipedes, even snails and slugs. Wow. So there's lots of bugs in there. It's a high yuck factor. Send the kids out to put the food waste into the compost pile. Now, I, I love this slide. One teaspoon of good garden soil has 100 million bacteria and 800 feet of fungal threats. That's organic soil, and that's what we're striving for. And when we set up a compost bin, one of the things that's always nice to do is to jumpstart it a little bit. Now... You can go out and get commercial jump starters. The grass clipping compost maker, which has lots of carbon, and the leaf compost kit, which has lots of nitrogen. They work. They're expensive. Okay? You can use that composted cow manure if you need nitrogen. Uh, you can also, if you've got leftover lawn fertilizer, you can use that to give it a boost. Okay? Um, Carbon, again, maybe straw or sawdust, but hang on to some leaves. And another thing you want to use to kind of inoculate your compost pile is finished compost. That's one of the best things you can put in there. It's got the bacteria and other things. If you don't have that, use some soil. Again, you can inoculate that bin to get some of those things in there to get it going. Now, you can shred material. Obviously, smaller particles are going to decompose faster because there's more surface area. I definitely think if you're going to do oak leaves, you've got to shred them. You know, there's no two ways around it. But you don't need a shredder. You can do it with your lawnmower. You know, shredding leaves with your lawnmower is wonderful. You can leave them right in the lawn. Uh, you don't have to rake them. It's just a great way to do it. But you can also attach the bagger and shred them up or the other thing I've done is put them in a long windrow of leaves and just run the lawnmower back and forth over right in front of the compost bin and then shovel it in uh, as well. The downside to it is that the smaller particles could lead to clumping and anaerobic conditions. So you always want to make sure that things are kind of floofed up, okay? You don't want to compress things in. You don't want to pack that compost bin full. Pile aeration. So the most common way to aerate is turning it when it comes time to turn it. Uh, but you want to make sure that you don't compact the pile. Uh, one of the things that I've started doing, and um, I've not done any unscientific tests, but I've liked the results, so I've stuck with it. I have some one-inch PVC pipe. And I take that one-inch pipe and I drill holes all the way through at both sides. Just how many holes? Eh, enough. <laughs> and the idea is then it sticks out. I put it about a third of the way in from the corners of my compost bin. And that just provides some more air going in. 
You can move it even further into the center if you want. And you can find them as you get them. You know, that's what I did. I, I found the PVC pipe. I didn't go out and buy it, although it's not that expensive. Uh, you can also use, as this illustrates here, you can also use the bigger black, it's usually HDPE uh, pipe. Uh, we always have it around our sump pump outlet, but some people use it on their drains as well. Put one of those in the middle, drill some holes through it again, and it just provides some more airflow down inside the, uh, uh, the pile. And it does, it does make a bit of a difference uh, to keep that airflow going uh, towards the center. But again, it's not necessary. But it's, this is just kind of one of those nice little things you can do. Um, turning the pile uh, does aeration. Sometimes you just stir it up a little bit. A pitchfork is your best tool. Uh, not, not, not a digging fork. Oh, digging forks work. If the, you don't need to run out and get a pitchfork. But you can put it on your Christmas list. You know. <laughs> but you can just use a, a, a digging fork, uh, a pitchfork, and if what you have is a spade, that's fine. They also have these aerating tools that uh, usually get sold uh, along with the commercial compost bins uh, because they, they're easier to access the inside of them. Uh, they do work just fine. They're not that expensive, but again, if you've got a pitchfork, what the heck? You know, I'm always one of those people that, except for kitchen gadgets, I'm one of those people that believes in multi-use tools. You know, the less, you know, single-use tools aren't always the most practical thing to have. But that doesn't count my rice cooker. <laughs> now, we're going to talk about building a pile. And water is an important piece of this. So we found our location. We're going to build the pile. It's probably a mixture of sun and shade. But if it's all in the sun, just realize you may have to add some more moisture later. If it's all in the shade, you're going to want to add a little less moisture because it won't be evaporating. Um, so you've cleaned off the ground so it's in direct contact with the soil. Now at the bottom of the pile, this is a good place to put things like small branches, kind of cross-hatched, uh, or corn stalks. Uh, those would work down there as well if you happen to have those. Or another thing that we come up with from our gardens are uh, Brussels sprout stalks. I love Brussels sprouts, but I know of only two things to do with the stalks. One is put them down at the bottom of the compost pile. The other is to keep one next to your bed to whack burglars if they come in the basement, if they come in the window. So you want something down there like that. It helps stop things from being compressed too tightly against the soil and just gives a little bit more airflow at the bottom. Then you put in a layer of brown material. How thick that layer should be is not all that important, only in relationship to the layer of green. Okay, a couple inches, three inches, you'll figure it out as you go along too. As you start filling the bin more often, you'll, you'll know what size works best. You put in your layer of brown, and because your brown is the dry material, this is where you add your moisture. You want to add it. Uh, if you use, a, you got a nice little misting hose like this, great. Or you put your hose nozzle at that fine spray mist setting. Or you use the watering can that still has the sprinkling head on it. I have one that doesn't and one that does. And I always, that's the one I always use. Use the one that still has the sprinkling head on it. I always step on those for some reason. <laughs> um, and you want it to be as wet as a wrung out sponge. So you don't want it to drip. But it should be damp. Start out, add a little bit. It's always better to add too little first and then decide after you stir it maybe a little bit to bring some stuff up from the bottom of that brown layer. Maybe I should add a little bit more on top. Okay. Then when you've wet, when you've damped that layer of brown material, this is where you should sprinkle in your finished compost or your soil. Maybe about a cup or two, not a lot. You're just trying to kind of inoculate things, and you want to spread it out, sort of like maybe sowing grass seeds or sprinkling powdered sugar on a donut or something, you know. You want it to be real light. You don't want it to clump. Then you put in your layer of green material. Now, if your layer of green material is going to be 
some garden waste and some food waste, put the food waste to the center. That's where most of your composting activity is going to take place, and that's the stuff you want to decompose quicker. And that's the stuff you will probably be adding during the course of this pile sitting there. You're going to get your pile set up, but you're going to keep generating food waste every couple of days. So you want to get that in the middle so it decomposes quicker. Then you start over again. Layer of brown material, a layer of uh, moisture, sprinkle in some soil or compost, layer of green. And you would continue to do that until you've gotten right up near the top. I like to put a layer of a couple inches of brown material at the top. Um, it looks good, looks better. It also, when you're adding food waste, at this point you've built it up. When you start adding food waste to a built pile, you're going to put it in the middle, you're going to dig down a few inches, you know, four to six inches if you can, maybe use a little garden trowel. And then you've got that brown material up there that you can use to cover it, but also sometimes to kind of mix in with the food waste as you're putting it in. Now, I've experimented a lot of ways with the layers. I have mixed layers after I have a brown and green layer, mixed it together. I have waited till I filled up the compost pile and mixed the brown and green layers together. And I have not mixed the brown and green layers together. And I really can't tell any difference. So on the lazy side, what the heck? You know, why mix it? Again, okay, something you can experiment with. Develop your own style. You know, I don't think it matters all that much. The one thing I would say is that especially in early fall, when you go out and mow the lawn and you've got a good amount of leaves on it and you're bagging it up with the grass, you've got grass in there, a good amount of grass and a good amount of leaves, you may not have to layer that at all. You just put that right in because you've got carbon and nitrogen mixed in. Um, then you've got your pile set and just walk away from it. In about two weeks, Go out there and stick your hand in, down about a foot or so, a little more maybe, towards the middle, and it should be warm. It should be starting to reach temperatures after three, two to four weeks of around 120, 140 degrees. So kind of like your hot water out of your sink, out of your, uh, so you'll know. If it's heating up, walk away, you're done. If it isn't, Go back and check it again in a week or so. And if it still isn't, then we can play around with it or we can assume that this might be a cold pile and it's going to do work a little slower. Okay, we'll talk about that in a little bit. But then the other thing you'll start to notice, and even if it's a cold pile that's working, you'll start to notice it. It'll start to settle. It'll settle um, anywhere from a third all the way down to two-thirds of its size. Um, now, you can check. If it's not getting hot, it might need some more air because there might be too much water in there. It also might be too much brown stuff. So then you want to try and mix in some more nitrogen <laughs> material. And then you might want to mix it up a little bit. Mix in the green stuff in your layers of brown stuff then. Try to expose that, uh, expose the brown material directly to the nitrogen all the time. Um, that would help it. If it's too much water, then you kind of need to air, let it air out a little bit. You might need to expose it a bit and let some of that moisture evaporate. That's why it's better to leave too much, too little water. My biggest textbook weakness when it comes to composting is I don't put enough water in. My piles usually get dry. So you can do pretty well with a pile that isn't quite wet enough. Um, the high temperature kills weed seeds, kills pathogens. That's the good thing. Compost, though, if it doesn't get up real hot, it'll still decompose. It's just going to go slower. Now, the compost bin is settled. Go out there 
after a few weeks. If you see, you know, if you see it kind of stopped settling or just uh, another, you just feel like checking it while you're out there. Put your hand in, and if it's cooled off, the process has run its course. That's time to turn it, the best time for me. Usually no sooner than six weeks. Now, you can turn it sooner than six weeks, but you're going to be disrupting the process usually. If it's still hot, you're going to be disrupting the process, and that's fine, but you're just going to be having to add more material and, and put more time. You're going to be putting more time and effort into it. And so, in theory, you'll end up getting more, more compost and being able to compost more material just so that you have to rebuild your bin sooner. Because once you get in to turn it, uh, you can pull your finished compost out, which is going to be in the middle and at the bottom. Or you can just choose to kind of turn it over, treat the remaining material, take the material from the outside, turn it to the inside, top to bottom, treat it like brown material, add moisture to it, and then just build right on top of it and not pull the compost out. Compost will continue to settle. It's not going to go away. You can do it that way as well. But finished compost is, you got all this great stuff. Basically, it's going to look like dirt. You know, usually it's going to be kind of moist uh, coming out of the pile. It's going to be moister than dirt. Unless you're like me and you've let the pile sit all year, and then it tends to be drier. Um, and it's definitely going to have a really nice earthy smell, and then you're ready to use it. When you're going to start over again, like I say, you're going to try to turn top to bottom, inside to the center. Um, that's why it's always nice to have room next to it. If you don't, I mean, you're going to have a bin that's going to open up. You're going to pull that stuff out, and you're going to restart the process and then just shovel it back in. That's fine. Uh, but just start it again with the twigs or some bulky material at the bottom brown and just go ahead and build your pile now you can screen compost at home uh, this is a very elaborate one um, I have a compost screen the only reason I have a compost screen is I bought a house and somebody left one it's basically a wood frame with hardware cloth on the bottom it's a glorified sieve and they're great. I mean, it turns this stuff into really fine, the kind of dirt that people pay hundreds of dollars a truckload for. Um, you don't need to screen it. There's going to be little bits of twigs, little bits of stuff that's in there. That's not going to bother you. You should screen it, as I said, if you're going to use it on the lawn. Um, when I start, Usually when I start screening, it's because I have a lot of it. And I'm going to try and put the other stuff back in, the unfinished stuff back in. But you can build those, and you can find those plans on the Internet, I'm sure. Um, now some of the problems you might run into. I think the two biggest problems we're concerned about is odors and pests. If you have a rotten odor, smells like rotten eggs, sulfur, that's almost always from anaerobic conditions. So you've got too much water or too much compaction. Or sometimes maybe, because I know it wouldn't be anybody in here, but spouses or children or grandchildren may have stuffed some spaghetti sauce in the compost bin. You know, That's one of the problems of having 20-somethings house sit. Oh, like, wow, you can't compost spaghetti sauce? I didn't know that. So <laughs> that's what's going to happen. And really, uh, about the only thing you can do is open it up. Turn, bring it out, turn the pile, start over again. If it's not really bad, now you might find that it's just in a small area. <coughs> then break that area up and deal with that particular section. But uh, if it's a general thing, then unlike what we usually do with odor, which is spray something over it so nobody can smell it, we'll open this up and turn it over and rebuild the pile and try and figure out whether it was from uh, uh, too much compaction or too much... Uh, uh, it just was too much compaction or too much water. If you get an ammonia smell, that's going to be too much nitrogen um, almost every time if it smells like ammonia. So you're going to need to put brown material in. And again, that's why you hang on to some of those leaves. If you're putting in a lot of food waste, add some leaves to it as you put it in. Or if you're getting the, the rotten smell from too much compaction, 
you also might want to you might want to check and see if you ground up your leaves too small too. That could be another problem with it. Now critters. Generally speaking, you will see critters because of meat, fat, dairy products, or sometimes the smell that leads them to believe. <laughs> Smells like cheese. Let's go. You know, that's when they'll show up. So get that stuff out of there. And again, tell those 20 something house sitters no baloney in the compost pile. Um, you can also convert to a more animal proof bin, something with a snap on lid. Uh, you could put wire mesh down as a floor, some hardware cloth that's going to extend beyond the width of your compost pile compost bin that'll stop some from burrowing um, if you have a persistent problem then you're going to want to move indoors and do vermicomposting but generally speaking I mean and I live out I live out in Cherokee where I got deer sleeping underneath the lilac bushes and lots of critters running around and I haven't had much of a problem at all I've never seen possum skunk hanging in the backyard once in a while, a raccoon, I put some bricks around the, the bottom of my one compost bin where I put all my food waste in and I haven't seen them since. Now, the one creature you might see in your compost pile, even though you're doing everything right, you might see mice. Not often. Very, it's not that often, but you might see them because it's dark and it's warm and they need a place to live. So they might hop in there in the wintertime. You won't see them in there. You shouldn't see them in there in the summertime, but they might move in in the winter. Um, ideally, they move out before you go to turn it. Uh, if they're still there, then it's up to you whether you're going to be part of the Mouse Liberation Army or you're going to use your pitchfork for another purpose. But again, it's just not going to happen that often. Now, briefly, I want to spend a couple minutes talking about our Leave the Leaf program, too as a way to help people use more of their leaves on their own property. In addition to hanging on to them for composting, uh, using your lawnmower to mulch a lot of your leaves right into the lawn really works. You have to shred them down. You, know, you, need, you usually need a mulching mower to get it down to about the size of a dime. And you want to have a quarter of an inch to a half inch of grass showing above the leaves. But then they will decompose right there, providing nutrients to the lawn, phosphorus and carbon in this case. It's like your grass clippings juice it back up with nitrogen and moisture. These will add the phosphorus and carbon. It will depth, increase the depth of organic matter in the soil. And it makes the lawn softer. The roots grow deeper. Uh, it's just a healthier lawn if you can do it right. So it's something to think about um, with your leaves, leaving them right on the lawn. Another thing you can do is use them as a mulch. Now, if you're mulching them around perennials, they should be shredded. And give a little bit of room around the stalk, but mulch around perennials. Uh, I take lots of leaves and put them on my garden once I've cleaned it out. I till them in in the spring because that's when I rent a tiller. <laughs> but if you have a tiller, you could go ahead and till them, into the, till them in in the fall, too. That's fine. Uh, that's another thing you can do with them. And then if you've used them as a mulch around some of your plants, you can just put, work them right back into the soil there as well. Now, you can make leaf mold. Uh, some people will go out and buy leaf mold. Uh, they'll pay money for this. You can, if you use leaf mold, you can make it yourself. If you don't use leaf mold, I wouldn't get too concerned about it. Uh, it's kind of like a, a poor man's peat moss. Uh, you're going to shred it. You're going to let it sit in a pile or in one of those little leaf holding bins for as much as two years. You don't have to turn it, turn it a little bit, and you have this stuff that isn't compost, but it isn't quite leaves either. And you can use that. And it's a great soil conditioner. Uh, it helps uh, the soil hold water, and it makes it easier for roots to get in. So that's something else you can consider doing. And finally, of course, grass cycling, which I'm sure we all do, leaving our grass clippings in the lawn. 
So that sort of runs the gamut of the slides. Uh, questions? Yes, sir. Um, you don't really need it. There's not much you can do to change it. It's going to freeze. Uh, sure, you can. Um, you'll get a feel for when it's not working anymore for food. Yeah. Um, and then you they just hold up till it warms up. Yeah. Yeah. And cover. As long as you've got cover and room, you can go ahead. But yeah, you'll, you'll reach a point where it's going to be pretty much, especially the part that stays moist in the center, that's going to be frozen pretty solid. The good news is there is some freezing and thawing that takes place over the course of some of those months where you're not going to add material in, and that'll break down the fiber so when things get going again in the spring, it breaks down pretty quick. Okay. Well, thank you all very much. There are some, I, I did bring, a, there's a real nice little folder, a trifold handout. Uh, that uh, the DNR has put together. Uh, it's been in existence for decades. Um, and uh, they keep making small changes to it, but it's a really nice little handy reference guide to keep. Um, we have it in our office. Uh, for those of you watching on TV, we can mail it to you. You can usually pick them up at Madison Public Libraries as well. It's uh, a real good uh, basic reference for composting called Reap a Heap of Benefits. Uh, the Madison libraries have many books about composting, uh, so there are other references there as well. And then finally, the City of Madison Streets Division's website has uh, kind of a refresher on some of this material, and there's a, uh, a video there of me working on an outside bin. So there are lots of other references there, and you can always call me, too, if you run into a, uh, a roadblock. But... Uh, this should be just a rotten good time. Where, where, where do you get the screen compost? The, the Dane County has uh, two compost sites where they make it available. One is in Verona. Uh, at the first Verona exit off the highway, off Verona Road, uh, you know where the Dane County home is there? And Badger Prairie Park? Well, it's in Badger Prairie Park. If you turn at that very first stoplight, turn right, and the compost site is... Uh, another sharp right. There'll be a sign that says compost site. And then there is also one in Wanakee. If you take Highway 113 out of town, you get to where it joins up with, with Highway 19. If you go to the left, you go into Wanakee. If you go to the right, you'll head towards the interstate. Take the right, and it'll be on the left-hand side, uh, just off of that 19 there, where uh, there is a compost site and also the sheriff's uh, shooting range. If you've gone to the shooting range, you've gone too far. Um, you can get the hours for those sites on the Dane County website, which is uh, co.dane.wi.us, and then click on recycling, and that'll lead you to uh, those sites because their hours aren't always consistent from site to site. And so I don't have them memorized. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all very much.